Hi, this is Tracy, and welcome to the assessment of the respiratory system. This is chapter 29 in your Ignatius and Workman um, Medical Surgical book. What we're going to do is a brief anatomy and physiology review so that you can have this information prior to uh, coming to the first day of class when we discuss oxygenation. So when you're thinking anatomy and physiology, remember that your respiratory tract is divided into parts. So you have the upper respiratory tract that um, is the nose, sinuses, pharynx, and larynx. And then you have the lower respiratory tract that is the trachea, two main stem bronchi, the bronchioles, alveolar ducts, and then the alveoli. Your lungs are protected by your rib cage, and then they are also enclosed by the pleura. Uh, they are the accessory muscles of respiration. Um, oxygen delivery and the oxygen hemoglobin um, dissociative curve is something that we're going to be talking about. And then we are also going to discuss respiratory changes um, associated with aging. So we'll look at uh, the child as well as the adult uh, when we are talking about that. So the role of the respiratory system um, is to warm, humidify, and filter uh, the air that we breathe in. So when you're looking at that, remember the responsibility um, that is associated with the particular body structures. We know that um, in order to have adequate oxygenation, adequate perfusion, we have to have adequate intake of oxygenation. Our heart has to work well enough to deliver the oxygenation and then our red blood cells have to be proficient enough to carry that oxygenation to the rest of our body systems. So with the assessment of um, the upper airway tract, um, think about your nose, think about um, the sinuses, look at the external nose, um, are there any deformities or tumors, look at the nares, look for any septal deviation, um, look at the color, so are the mucous membranes pink and moist, are they dry, um, is there any swelling, bleeding, those types of things. Oftentimes our patients on oxygenation will have um, maybe dried out mucous membranes if they do not have humidified oxygen. So we want to make sure that we do give them um, humidified oxygen when they are um, under our care in the hospital. With the pharynx, trachea, and larynx, um, remember the location of these, um, that your mouth leads into the posterior pharynx. When you are assessing your neck, make sure you're looking for symmetry, alignment, and checking for any masses, swelling, bruises. You know, are they using the accessory muscles of the neck for breathing? And when you see that, it's really um, important to know that that patient is working hard to breathe. You will see um, it more pronounced in children or people that are much more thin. Um, look at the trachea. Is it midline? Is it shifted one way or the other? When you're looking at the trachea, look for those distended neck veins. Are you seeing any uh, distension that might make it look like our patients are uh, working harder um, when they are breathing? So when you are looking at these pictures, um, on the left side, you'll see structures of the larynx, and on the right side, um, it has details of the glottis, the two vocal cords, uh, the intervening space, and then the um, rimaglottitis um, at the bottom of that. The thing with that is when patients are intubated, this is the picture right here that they are, that your nurse anesthetist or anesthesiologist is looking for when they need to intubate patients. Remember the different lung sounds that are associated um, with the pharynx, trachea, and larynx. When you're thinking about that, patients that have strider, you know, it means that that area is closing down and the patient is going to have um, different lung sounds than what they would normally see or what you would normally hear when there is swelling or um, congestion in that area. Moving on, when you're looking at the lungs and thorax, ask the patient to sit up if they're able to. Um, inspect, observe, comparing one side to the other, making sure you always work from the apex and then move downward toward the base. Always remember side to side and how many lung sounds do you listen to on each side. 
be observant of the rate, the rhythm, the depth of those inspirations. What we are looking at when we're taking a deeper look at oxygenation, we're looking at how um, our patient's oxygenation status is being compromised. So we're going to be looking at things like asthma, um, COPD, emphysema, respiratory um, synectical virus. So you know we need to be very cognizant of what our patients look like. Are they laying in bed, tolerating breathing? and doing fine, that would be the quote unquote normal where you have respirations between um, 10 and 22 for the adult patient or are they having dyspnea, do they have orthopnea, what is going on with them. So very, you know, be, pay close attention to what those things look like. Um, examine the diameter uh, with the lateral diameter if you have a patient uh, that is experiencing problems or if you have a patient that has trauma. If you're not able to assess the respiratory rate, then um, you can palpate, you can lay your hand on their chest and listen that way or be able to feel that way and determine uh, their respiratory rate. Crepitus, uh, crepitus is what you will note when someone has a puncture wound and the air is leaking out into the um, intercostal spaces, maybe up toward the clavicle. When you feel that, what it will feel like is kind of what I would compare that to Rice Krispies underneath Saran Wrap and if you um, feel what that looks, it's kind of a popping sort of bubbly um, feel to it. So you do need to be palpating for that um, as well. When you are looking or listening to lung sounds, actually, if you re go to page burst and you look uh, um, at the end of this chapter, there are many audio clips on the different breath sounds that we'll be talking about. Um, so where will you hear bronchial lung sounds? What do bronchial lung sounds sound like? How about the bronchial vesicular? And then lastly, the vesicular. So you need to be able to determine what those different sounds are and where you will be hearing those sounds when you are listening to your patient um, and assessing their lung sounds. So with your bronchial um, lung sounds, they should sound very tubular, calm, hollow, very loud. You'll hear them during inspiration and expiration. Um, and those are going to be heard over the trachea and larynx. When you are listening to the bronchial vesicular, um, as far as their pitch and amplitude, they are fairly moderate. The inspiration and expiration should be equal um, when you hear them, and the quality can be mixed. But where you're going to be hearing these bronchial vesicular um, are over the major bronchi where there's not very many alveoli located, um, typically posterior between the scapula and the anterior around the upper sternum in the first and second intercostal spaces. And then when you're listening to vesicular, those should be very low. Um, typically they're fairly soft. Um, inspiration will be greater than expiration. And when you're listening to the vesicular, it sounds kind of like rustling or what you could think about is if you put your hair kind of um, not right up to your ear, but if you roll your hair in between your fingers, um, sometimes that can sound like vesicular, or if you put it up real close, it'll be um, the crackling sound. But sometimes it sounds um, like the wind in the trees. Um, so those are going to be the differences with those types of lung sounds. And then when you move on to adventitious sounds, adventitious just means abnormal. So these sounds aren't something that we should hear. And if we do hear them, then we need to um, be checking into that and understand understanding or finding out what the cause is. Why is this happening? Um, so when you're listening um, or when you're when you're doing your assessment and you hear crackles, what is, you know, crackles, they used to be called rails. Typically they're brief, small pops. Um, they're often due to secretions. So when you hear crackles, maybe have your patient cough, try to listen again, see if that clears. Um, or is it that they have congestive heart failure and their, their lungs are very wet and they're not able to cough and clear that. So sometimes the secretions um, are going to be a problem. So fluid volume overload, uh, maybe bronchitis, pneumonia, um, some type of atelectasis going on. Um, they can be fine, um, and fine crackles are typically um, high-pitched. They're brief. 
Um, and like I said before, it sounds like rubbing hair together. The coarse crackles are low pitch, they're loud, longer in duration. Um, and so you can be taking a lesson uh, for those different sounds. With wheezing, when you think about wheezing, um, wheezing is when your lungs are clamped down. So there isn't adequate oxygenation and our patients aren't able to get that air through. So we need to be thinking about what's causing that wheezing. Um, and so when you're thinking about that, think about asthma. Um, sometimes your um, COPD ears. Um, but there is the saying when you think about asthma, um, all that's wheezing is not asthma and asthma doesn't always wheeze. And so when you think about that statement, kind of ponder it, think about it again, all that wheezing is not asthma and asthma doesn't always wheeze. So you can't always associate asthma with wheezing and just because your patient is wheezing doesn't always mean it's going to be um, asthma. When you're thinking about the next one, ronchi, ronchi is typically in the big areas of the lungs, the major airways. So again, try to have them cough, see if they can clear that. The pleural friction rub is when there is um, pleurisy or there's some swelling in that pleural space. And oftentimes um, it's kind of a lower pitch sound, but when you are um, assessing for a pleural friction rub, your patients will really complain of pain and it'll be really uncomfortable for them um, to take deep breaths in and out. And so they'll have um, a quite a bit of pain when you're looking at a pleural rub. Another one I would like you to be aware of is Strider. It's not listed out on this slide, but Strider um, is loud and harsh. It is typically due to swelling of the airway. So when your patient's trying to inhale, there is a negative pressure, and the negative pressure is generated in the pleura, which collapses the upper airway. Um, there's definitely increased shortness of breath. It requires stronger um, inspiratory efforts, which puts more pressure on that airway to close. So when you think strider, you can think obstruction of the larynx or trachea um, in those upper airways. Strider requires immediate um, intervention. Um, you may see this, um, especially if you are doing um, surgical nursing or the um, post-op nursing um, following extubation and when they have some inflammation of those vocal cords. So um, just be really aware of what those lung sounds are. Just a couple of quick pictures for you. When you're doing assess uh, your assessment, just talks about location um, and the anterior and posterior chest landmarks. This is stuff that you have learned in intro, um, but do remember that everything you learn, you need to pull forward, you need to be thinking about. Um, as far as assessment of the lungs and thorax when you are doing percussion and um, auscultation, again, they're numbered out for you um, the same way that you were uh, taught in um, intro to nursing. Other indicators of respiratory inadequacy, um, clubbing of fingers. If people have um, clubbing of fingers, that means that they've had obviously um, low oxygenation for quite some time. Um, we often see weight loss because when they have a full tummy, they don't feel like breathing. That full tummy takes up the extra airway um, or extra space for their lung expansion and so they're not able um, to breathe and um, tolerate um, food and so they end up losing weight. Um, unevenly developed muscles, you'll see uh, maybe flail chest, um, which is that the, ch the rib cage is much larger um, and muscles are just developing differently. Look at the skin and mucous membrane. Um, if you're seeing anything cyanotic, those are going to be some late signs. So be cognizant of the early signs um, so that you aren't getting in to the life-threatening uh, scenarios and having to deal with the life-threatening situations later. Look at their general appearance. How are they breathing? Endurance. Can they get up and walk to the bathroom or are they so short of breath that they maybe need a bedpan. We're not going to see a lot of Foley catheters put in patients just because of um, the risk, the increased risk for infection. So that kind of is a real brief um, overview of anatomy and physiology. So be sure you take a read of chapter 29 and are able to understand how the respiratory system works. And so when you come to class, we can move right into um, 
alterations. So I will be seeing you at class very soon.